Good morning. Would you stand for our call to worship? Even in the middle of summer, our hearts can be burdened. You have come to a special place where you can find relief and healing. Come, prepare your hearts to receive God's gracious gift of love. Matthew chapter 14, 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured the sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Praise be to God. Uh, you want to join me in the unison prayer, please. In the darkness of night, in the brightness of day, you, O oh Lord, are present to us. And we were so with situations which seem to drain us of our energy, we struggle to find out who you call us to be. You reach out to us with reassurance of empowerment and courage for the days ahead. Calm our spirits and prepare our hearts and lives to receive your awesome grace. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome back. Did you have a good trip? Yeah, okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, our story today that we just heard talks about 5,000 people gathered to hear Jesus. Now, 5,000 people would be like taking all of the people in Avoca and Wheeler and Cohocton and gather them all in one place to hear Jesus talk. Well, it got to be evening and they were hungry. It's starting to get dark. Where do you go? In Jesus' time, there's no McDonald's. There's no drive throughs nice. I'm not sure they could handle 5,000. <laughs> That'd be 100 tour buses. Think of that. 100 tour buses pull into a restaurant at one time. <laughs> Jesus said, well, what do you have? And they said, we have the five loaves and two fish. And you had up the mosaic earlier of that from the Church of the Multiplication. And what would five loaves of bread do? Even if they were Wonder Bread giant size, what could you do for 5,000 people? You might get a little crumb. Yeah, that's about it. But Jesus gave thanks to God, broke the bread, and they started passing it out. And by the time they got done, they had 12 baskets full of leftovers, a lot more than they started with. Now, some people will say, well, other people must have had some bread and fish and stuff with them, so they must have pulled it out as long as everybody was sharing. But to feed 5,000 people... That's a lot of folks. I think that was really a miracle. And I think that those people who were there were kind of looking to see, what can this Jesus do? You know, this was kind of like the magic show of the time. Here's this guy out in the wilderness, and he's healing people. And he's letting people walk who could never walk before as they walk right away from me. 
<laughs> I'm losing them. Yeah, well, such is life. And Jesus cared about those people. He cared about the fact that they were hungry. He cared about the fact that they were hurt or injured in some way. And part of what we need to remember is this took place right after Jesus found out that John the Baptist, his cousin, had just been killed. So he was trying to get away where he could have some quiet time and, and feel bad about what happened to John. But the crowds were there and Jesus put them first. That's the example he set for us. We always should be working on doing things for others. That was the role that Jesus said, even in marriage, and I think in any relationship, any friendship, if it's all about what you can get out of it, it's not going to work very well. But if it's something you can do for the other person or give up something in order to make them happy, that makes the friendship a lot stronger. Let's pray. Dear God, help us to follow Jesus' example even when we don't always feel like it. Help us to be kind to others, to offer a smile or a hug or whatever it may take to cheer them up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Reading from the Old Testament, Genesis 32, 22 through 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and sorry, I'm so short, <laughs> and his eleven children, and crossed the ford. <laughs> I'll get a stool next time. And crossed the ford of the Jacob. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything he had had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have stri striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place, yeah, Neil, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. This next line is times two because I forgot it last time. This is the word of the Lord. Praise Praise be God. We have come from Abraham to Isaac and then to Esau and Jacob. Today we are at the point where Jacob has been gone out of fear of his brother for about 20 years and he's finally making his way home with all of the things that he has accumulated. He finally has a moment alone. I suspect being a twin he very seldom had that. But again he's alone and God appears to him in the form of an angel. We're not exactly told who this is but we'll call it an angel for sake of uh, argument. Now, one thing that I think we need to get straight is I don't believe that the angels look like the cute little cherubs that we see. I don't think they have the little butterfly-type glistening wings. I think probably our image should be something more like a bouncer at a club who's named Bruno. 
you think about just a few chapters ago, three men appeared, and you remember Abraham, or Abram at that time still, said to his wife, prepare this huge quantity of food, probably enough to feed about 50 that these three people were going to eat. These were not little cherub weaklings. And I think about all the places that we see where an angel appears to someone in the Bible. The first thing they say is, don't be afraid. Now, if you've got the cute little cherub shows up to grant your three wishes, you're probably not going to be that afraid. So I'm not quite sure what these characters may have looked like, but I'm pretty sure they were the rough and rugged type. And Jacob hadn't counted on that. He's overcome his birth order. He's overcome his brother. He's overcome his father's plan to bless Esau. He has been away for 20 years and been quite successful. And we might look at it and say, how can God bless someone like this? This is a scoundrel. I mean, he's named scheming, grabbing, and yet God uses people like that. God uses people like us who aren't quite perfect, with the exception of Henry, I know. <laughs> yeah, some people have delusions, but that's okay. <laughs> There's two things that I think we can agree on that would be spiritual truths. If you are down and out, things look like they are at their very worst, there will always come along something to lift you up. You will not stay down forever. Now it may be the eternal glory when you are raised out of death that raises you up, but you will indeed be raised. The second thing I think we could easily agree on is if you're at the top of the world, you're feeling powerful and in control of your world, something will bring you down. And it may not be until the six feet of sod, but you will go down eventually. No one gets out of this life alive, as the saying goes. We will always find some type of balance there. Now in Jacob's case, it was the time to face reality, the bringing him down to earth. Jacob has schemed and has paid the price and may still face the price. He's still under threat of death by his brother, but it's time to go home. He's not sure what he's walking into. It's going to be hard for him to do the typical Jacob strut when he's limping after this occasion. Just think about what that would be like. An angel appears and you wrestle. Finally realizing you can't be overpowered, the angel puts your hip out. Those, how many of you have had a hip replacement? Oh, mom's not here. You know the pain prior to that. I remember mom going through that. She finally reached a point. She said, I don't care what they do, whether they cut it off. It's got to go. I can't deal with the pain anymore. Imagine spending the rest of your life with that. This was not just a limp, I'm sure. This was... The joint was truly out of place for the rest of his life. And yet, this is the person who is most blessed. This is the person who becomes renamed Israel. This is who the 12 tribes will come from. This is the chosen one from the lineage from Abraham down to the Christ. This is the schemer. How does that fit in to that lineage? Why would God choose to do that? Just imagine if it had all been perfect people down through that whole list. We would think God can only use us once we're perfect. But that's certainly not the case in this list. If you go back through the genealogy, we find all these flawed people. And God chose to use them. Now we might think about non-believers struggling with God, but here we have the patriarch of the Jewish family struggling with God. And in some ways that's what we still do today, isn't it? 
We have Bible studies, we have men's groups, and we come out with more questions than answers. That is a part of digging into our faith. If we have no questions, it probably means we're not thinking about our faith at all. Because if there aren't parts about God that really scare you, you have probably not spent much time in the Bible. Would you agree? There are some pretty odd things in the Bible. Fortunately, God is big enough that we don't understand all of him, or her, or it, whatever the correct terminology is. English lacks that good word for generic. Um, we'll probably come up with one, but that's where society is going. But I wonder, isn't it a good thing that we don't understand God? I don't want a God as small as the little box I can imagine. And yet there are parts of the Bible that we go through and we say, why would God do this or allow this? And those are just parts we have to accept. It is part of God and we don't understand why. We really don't need to understand why. There's plenty of what we do understand that we can't fulfill. There's lots of teachings in there that some people like to make a checklist, and that's not what God calls us to do. God is not going to love you more because you went to church on Sunday, check, read the Bible each day, check. God already loves you. And because he does, we want to get to know him better, so we do those things. They are good things to do, but we need to keep our priorities straight. It's not that we are going to make God love us more by doing them. It's like having a good friend, any friendship. If you spend time together, the friendship goes, grows stronger. The longer you are apart, or the more you ignore each other, the friendship weakens. It's just that simple. It is that type of a relationship that God wants with us. Jacob said to the angel, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, we're not sure if that was out of pure panic, or if he was really that brave coming up to this point. But regardless, he wants to be blessed, and the angel does just that. And that's what we might call the good news. This mysterious stranger in the night, this person who has the power to wound and to heal, blesses Jacob, now renames him Israel, and is the one who strove with God and won. We think about how many times in the Bible people are renamed, and we go, oh, it just confuses me. I just learned how to say one name. Now we're going to rename them something else. But often it is at a time of a change of character, a change of heart. We think of Peter, who was Simon, who became the rock, whose little bit of faith is what God says I can build a church on. Here, Jacob becomes Israel. He's no longer the screamer, schemer, the grabber. He is now the one who struggled. And that's the name of the Israel nation, the one who struggled. They still carry that name. And it's no different for us as Christians growing out of that tradition. When we struggle, when we struggle to walk with God, when we get our blessings, they may be a mixed bag. Jacob asked for a blessing, but he left with a limp to remind him of that struggle. We all bear the scars of life along the way. We've had our dark nights, our time of confusion. The blessing is not always this warm, fuzzy, wonderful thing. I'm currently reading a book that says, if experience is such a good teacher, why do I keep repeating the course? <laughs> 
and it kind of talks about this, the different things that we go through in life, they can be bad, but they can also be good for us in the long run, depending on how we respond to them. Are you willing to learn from them and move on? Or will you just wallow in, oh, woe is me? Sometimes wallowing is good. It's necessary for a short period of time. Then we need to learn our lesson, pick ourselves up, and move on. And that's exactly what Jacob had to do in this case. And we have to do in our walk as well. Now, we have this new name, which will take us forward in the story. We're now no longer the leg-pulling grabber. We are the one who struggled. And aren't we still today the ones who struggle? Let's pray. Dear God, you teach us perseverance by the things that we go through each day. The struggles that we have, the questions that come to our minds, the doubts that appear in the dark valleys as we walk through. But we know we can cling to you because there is nothing else to cling to. We know that you promise to walk with us even if you do not spare us from the trials. Lord, we ask your blessing. We ask that you will open our hearts and minds that we may sense your presence and that we may truly be the disciples you call us to be. We pray this in the name of Jesus our Christ, who offered himself for us. Amen. I would ask that you would join me in your hymnal on page 12, and you'll find there the prayer of confession and pardon. This is when I go back to teaching. And if you, when you find it and you're ready, raise your hand. <laughs> Let us pray together our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we are not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ. Then we're kind of going to change this a little bit, um, so you're not going to do all of your responses today. I found a communion service, which is from the Reverend Rex Hunt, and I've adapted it for us today. It is a service of communion for the summer. O oh God, true source of humanity, creator and father of us all, you renew us so that we may grow like you. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to the God of the summer day, God of the early dawn and the lingering sunset, God of the hot north wind and the refreshing shower, God of the shady tree and the cool water, God of the ripening harvest and the sparkling sea. All creation blesses the source of energy and life for all things bright and beautiful, for all things dark and mysterious and lovely, for all things green and growing and strong, for all things weak and struggling to push life up through rocky earth, for all human faces, hearts, minds, and hands which surround us, praise and wonder be. And so we join our praise with all your people across the generation as we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. 
heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In our praise and thanksgiving, we also remember the ways of Jesus, who walked the dusty roads of Galilee, who taught from seashore and mountainside, who told stories of the sower and the seed, the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. We, too, know your presence in the beauty of creation. Right, Sharon? On the walks, it's wonderful, isn't it? Yes, you picture all those things. We also remember, creating God, that your care for this earth and your people can be denied. For your goodness was abused and your son was betrayed. On the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. grape, bread, and juice, he spoke of the coming death and his new life, asking his disciples to remember him as now we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is written. Christ will come again. Be present with us now, enfolding God as we share this sacrament. Let your Holy Spirit brood among us and up on and through this bread and wine. Bless us with a desire to praise in song and story and word. Bless us with a sharpened awareness of your presence. Bless us with deep compassion. Bless us with the patience and daring of the mystics and abide with us all at all times and through all eternity. Amen. Would those who are assisting this morning please come forward? Do we have anyone who would prefer to receive gluten-free? All right. You're lucky. <laughs> Having tried the best at that, it, it's still a little crumbly and does not taste quite like regular bread yet. It's still working on it. Generous giver of life, you supply us with all good things. May this bread and wine be the nourishment that we seek, and may it transform us into the disciples who serve in your creation. Amen. All right, with that, would you receive the benediction? You have been fed with the bread of heaven and blessed by the presence and peace of God. Now go into the world in the peace of Christ to be bread for the world. In Christ's name, amen.